So um, we're going to start this session with some meditation. And so if you want to get yourself a good posture for meditation. So um, again, we're just talking about the, the wheel of sharp weapons. Um, the wheel, which is like, um, if you've ever seen a, like a Japanese samurai, um, you know, a throwing star, you know, the throwing stars they use. Um, or um, Vishnu's wheel, you know, in one of his four hands, he's holding a wheel of correct teachings. So there's these kind of references. But basically what we're talking about is a weapon to strike the heart of the enemy, the enemy being the self-cherishing thought, the self-cherishing thought coming from self-grasping. So that's where we are. So we'll do a little, a little meditation on that. So just get yourself nice and settled and take a moment to reconnect with refuge in bodhicitta. Just in your own mind to yourself, allow refuge in bodhicitta to be revived. And then in order to let the surface distractions settle, we'll spend a couple minutes watching the breath. Remaining steadily with the breath, without tension, without vagueness. And try not to have a narration over the top of your thoughts or to engage with them. Just allow them to come and go with or without words, keeping your main attention just on the breath. Deciding not to indulge distractions as best as you can.
And so then consciously shift from single pointed attention to analytical and start with the question, what is the self? What is my understanding of the self so far? Experientially, as well as what I've been taught and studied. What is the self? And let the question of what is the self resolve into two pieces. The self that conventionally exists, that which is merely labeled on the collection of body and mind. And that which does not exist at all, the false self, the pretender, the one we identify with. Just let your mind go back and forth, examining the two ways that we project self. One in alignment with conventional truth, one not even conventionally true, and yet feels so real. And sitting here quietly, that false self doesn't feel too problematic or aggressive. But just use a memory or use your imagination to think of a time when you have been strongly praised or criticized. When someone has said to you, you are amazing, you are terrible whatever it is that might trigger that self, that false self, to roar into vivid life, to become so obvious that it's hard to question. And so this self, this one that feels so real, so needy, so defensive, this one is the object of negation. And yet, this one is the one we think we are. And so because of it arises a very natural seeming self-cherishing that this little independent seeming I needs people to celebrate it, needs people to recognize it, needs to be defended, needs to be comforted. So many needs, so many wants. And yet when it gets what it wants, it always wants more. dissatisfied I, which is not the I at all. So just see if you can identify it without identifying with it. This pretender that makes self-cherishing seem so necessary. And so as you identify it without identifying with it, explore how it functions 
or rather dysfunctions in an ordinary day. All of the things it says it needs and wants in order to be comforted, in order to be soothed. But when self-cherishing is driving it, how nothing really feels satisfying. Moving from one activity to another, consuming one thing after another through various senses. Just notice the way that its cravings and what it says to be true really are never true. Self-cherishing says, if it would just stop raining, then I would be happy. And then it stops raining and it's not happy. Or it is for just a moment and then it focuses on something else not quite right. And then when things feel not quite right, then negative karma comes so easily. Destructive actions of body, speech, and mind. Because we're trying to get things to be right and correct and comforting. But the whole plan was doomed to failure because it came from ignorance. And then different sufferings ripen from past negative karma. And think of anything that is a little uncomfortable right now for you. Maybe the back, maybe the neck, maybe background worries about finances or relationships. And think this is the wheel of sharp weapons returning. This is the result of my own past negative actions. But those past negative actions came from self-cherishing, which came from self-grasping, which is ignorance. And so my enemy is ignorance, not myself, not the outside world. May I destroy ignorance. And just repeat that to yourself in your own way. The enemy is ignorance, not myself, not the external world. The enemy is ignorance. The enemy is ignorance and the weapon is wisdom. In particular, the wisdom of ultimate bodhicitta, the mind of bodhicitta qualified by the wisdom realizing emptiness. And so think that all of the mental energy you put into this analysis goes towards the full development of both relative and ultimate bodhicitta. And add to that the mantra of Manjushri under your breath. Oma Rapatsana Di, Oma Rapatsana Di, Oma Rapatsana Di, Oma Rapatsana Di. Om a rapid sanity, 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 Om a rapid sanity.
and relaxing your attention. And with your attention relaxed, then shifting back to study. Do you have any um, questions about the previous session about Dharma Rakshita, Yama, Yamantaka, and the analogy of um, peacocks in the poison grove? Did you want to ask anything about that before we move on? Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, is there any reason why a peacock was used in order to uh, depict bodhicitta, bodhisattva? Um, I mean, yes, in terms of like the poetry of it, this, um, there was an ancient idea that peacocks could eat poison and it made their feathers more beautiful. And so poetically, it sounds like a nice way to um, think about bodhisattvas eating the poison of saric suffering and it only making them more um, strong and rich, but it's just a, a poetry. And poetry and um, you know peacocks were highly celebrated you know being very beautiful and their feathers being very beautiful and indicating you know royalty and things like this um, you but, know, the, like, but the, the, the poetry the beauty is the outside side of the peacock and not the inside side of what it depicts so there's a sort of a contradiction um, it's not a it's not a contradiction. It's a, it's a metaphor. Right. It's okay. uh, yeah yeah. It's just poetry, right? It's a way okay. of thinking about things in in multiple ways. So you know we want um, you know images can trigger a certain part of the mind just like the wheel of sharp weapons itself. It's not like we have a physical wheel of sharp weapons that we're gonna throw and hit the ignorance with, but that imagery evokes something um, in us. And so okay. I think sometimes it's nice to use, um, it's nice to use poetry and imagery and sound and use as many senses as possible when engaging with the Dharma, because normally our senses are the troublemakers. So if we can use them for us instead of against us, um, it's gonna help us focus because we're multitasking anyway, we might as well make it work for us. I had, I had a question about the, the last presentation. If, sure. Can, so thank you, it was absolutely wonderful. Um, but I, it, it made me feel more vividly how this um, self is is kind of everything I've got, you know? So so I, I which is obvious, <laughs> but, but I, I find it, I don't know if it's only me that I'm especially self-grasping, but I, I find it very difficult to to find any like even the merest distance between the self and everything, life. Like, yeah. So, so for me, like distancing myself from the self is just dying. So, how do I overcome that? <laughs> even like just slightly, how do I? Yeah, it's, uh, I think actually it's quite a common feeling when you start digging into these things a lot, you know, I think the first few times you hear about emptiness of the self, it's, it's quite intriguing for some people, it triggers some fear for some people, it makes them inspired for lots of people, they just don't get it. But then once we've thought about it a bit, then you get that little like fear of annihilation that you're describing, you know, or like the fear of non existence. Yeah. And it said that that's quite a good sign, actually, because it's like you're, you're getting closer to the truth. So it's not that there is no self, right? It's just that there is no inherently existent self. 
and the self that we think we are is opposite to the self that actually is yeah what what appears to us is you know something with some sort of core or hub that is gathering experiences to it and pulling things out of it but has some sort of you know core pivot point that is always remain the same and then adds bits on top um, what is actually there is a you know merely labeled on a collection of experiences and you know nothing more than that you know just merely labeled on the collection of body and mind um, and so when you're starting out it's like on a quiet day when you're calm and there's not a lot of drama in your life the self is not not seeming to be that activated you know what i mean like it's just kind of a quiet not causing any trouble sort of a self and it seems funny to be so aggressive about wanting to destroy it but what you're really wanting to realize is how little it takes to get the false self to flare into life together with its self-cherishing and create a whole force field of protection that blocks others because it seems like they're a threat or is all kind of full of tentacles and needy sticky hands that says, come here, come here, come here, come here, and is gathering. So depending on if you're in a more aversion mood or a more attachment mood, you get this kind of push and pull energy because of the false idea of self so you know it just takes a little tiny threat or a little tiny invitation to get the false self to roar into life and say i am real when it never was the pretender never was real so to get a little bit of distance i think it you can you kind of pretend a little bit by comparing your rational calm self to your um, amplified self that is really obvious when you have a negative state of mind really activated. You know, like if you think about yourself right now compared to a terrible rage, it's like that doesn't even seem like you. You know, you were so irrational, it made no sense. And like two days later you thought, why did I say that? Why did I do that? It wasn't like that. You know, so if you can kind of use that comparison to just kind of work your way into these ideas, the difference between your rational side and your irrational side, then you're moving in the right direction, if that helps. Yes. Yeah, but you know, don't worry, if, if we realize the emptiness of the self, there won't be nothingness, it will be like everythingness. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, um, good question. Other questions or thoughts? Um, the conventional I, and mm. uh, the false eye that I, uh, that we believe that is continuant and uh, existing uh, always, come from the same source. The ignorance. There is a grain of of eye that goes from one life to another okay so this is the thing that from it uh, we develop in any in every life the conventional useful eye that uh, we put on the aggregates moment by moment in order to live in the conventional reality and and also the false uh, longitudinal uh, uh, I that we believe that exists from its own from its own side, right? So they they both stem from the same grain, from the same source. Well, almost, almost. It's it's a little dangerous how you're talking because it sounds like you think that the mind is the self, and the mind no. is not self no, no, no but the fundamental mind is what goes um the continuity of consciousness of the fundamental yeah. mind is what goes from life to life and carries the karmic seeds for okay. sure. so the the continuity of consciousness has you know kind of the three features i talk about a lot right the good news the bad news and the neutral news so the continuity continuity of consciousness has buddha nature which is the emptiness of it which means yeah. it can be developed into full enlightenment. It has innate ignorance that it's had from beginningless in time, and it, and it is clear and knowing. So the fact that it is clear and knowing is neutral. 
Yeah, and then it has together with it innate ignorance and Buddha nature. So those three things are going from life to life to life, but they're a continuity. It's not like it's one core thread that's staying like a rock solid thing, right? Okay. So one moment of it leads to the next, leads to the next, leads to the okay. next, carrying with okay. it, you know, karmic seeds and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So the self that exists conventionally is just that which is merely labeled on the collection of aggregates or mm -hmm. merely labeled on the body and mind, which is fine, right? But then you think, all right, so then the body and the mind, the body is merely labeled on its collection of parts, which are labeled on its collection of parts on its collection of parts. The mind is merely labeled on its collection of parts, its collection of parts, its collection of parts. So then you're not finding any core, are you? That everything yeah. is made of components, that everything okay. um, is dependently arising, and then things are interacting off of each other. So to say, in a kind of definitive way, this is me and myself, and this is you and yourself, the yeah. lines are more blurry than that, because okay. my mental experience is so directly related to what you've just said. So how can I take 100% ownership of it? You know what okay. I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So then self-grasping and self-cherishing are a little bit like chicken or the egg. Of course, you've always had self-grasping, but for us, we've also always had self-cherishing. We'll just hopefully um, <laughs> overcome it. Yeah. And so the antidote to self-cherishing is bodhicitta. The antidote to self-grasping is the wisdom realizing emptiness, right? So you need both of them, don't you, to become enlightened? Both antidotes. Yeah. Yeah, you with me so far? Venerable, do you want to add anything? <laughs> I see you in your wisdom. I think we can use you if you like. Um, no, I think, um, I think that's fine. It's really difficult to make the distinction between the two. I think if you don't really, what you need is awareness also, because just the intellectual stuff is like you think you have understood, but you don't really have. So, um, but... Um, yeah, I mean, you're doing fine. I don't need to do that. <laughs> so I go back into silence here, okay? Okay. I really enjoy your teachings really very much. So thank you so much. <laughs> don't mean to put you on the spot. It's nice to get to just listen sometimes if you're always the one that has to talk. It's nice to just listen. <laughs> if you're tired, then you can call again. But otherwise... <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. And um, I know there's a lot of um, older students here, you know, who've been Dharma students a long time. So if you've heard these teachings before from other teachers and you remember a cool bit that one of your teachers said, please jump in and add it if you're um, remembering teachings from your Geshis and your various Lamas, because it's, um, it's quite a popular teaching. And so probably some of you have heard it before. Um, a, a good commentary you can find online is Dr. Alexander Berzin um, under Study Buddhism. That website um, has a really cool um, commentary that's available for free that has a lot of the, the background of some of the imagery and um, a little bit more history about Dharma Rakshita, and um, that one's really cool, as well as the Geshe Sopa one. And then Geshe Zopa, who you guys know, um, who's some of your teacher, he has a commentary that if you just type in Geshe Zopa Wheel of Sharp Weapons, a PDF will come up. I think it's called Crystal Mirror, and it's a transcript of when he taught this. So um, Anna's asking, what's the name of the site? Um, the Alexander Burzen site is called Study Buddhism. And um, Geshe Zopa's, it was just a PDF that was uploaded online. So if you just Google Geshe Zopa. Okay, so continuing on with the verses. Okay, so now um, verse four, it says, now, 
Desire is the jungle of poisonous plants here. Only brave ones, like peacocks, can thrive on such fare. If cowardly beings like crows were to try it, because they are greedy, they might lose their lives. Five, how can someone who cherishes self more than others take lust and such dangerous poisons for food? If he tried like a crow to use other delusions, he would probably forfeit his chance for release. Okay, so verses four and five are starting to bring in this um, extra analogy of the crow. And of course we know that like conventionally peacocks are pretty stupid and crows are very smart. So yes, I do realize that scientifically <laughs> this is not a perfect analogy. But um, if you're thinking about it in terms of the poetry, the crows um, uh, picture them, you know, eating one little bit and then more and more and more and more and more and this kind of like hungry mind. Um, when, when my teacher was teaching this, he, um, he would say, think of bush turkeys. And if you've ever seen bush turkeys, they just run after any food that you throw them, even if it's bad for them. And they peck it for quite a while before they realize it's no good for them and then they get sick. So um, if we can think about how, for us, pr approaching something like Tantra, which is taking desire on the path or taking anger on the path, using negative states of mind in a transformative way as opposed to just kind of raw antidoting way. If we are to try that too soon, then what happens is that we get too intrigued by the experience and we get lost in the experience and become even more deluded than ever. That's what happens when you're not having strong bodhicitta and at least some understanding of emptiness and you try to do practices that are more advanced than you're able to, is that you wind up either completely misunderstanding and getting no results, or misunderstanding and getting lost in your delusions. So this is a reference to Tantra, and it's a reference to thought transformation teachings, Lo Zhang. And so um, these crows are seen to be cowardly and greedy, and so if they were to do exactly the same thing as the bodhisattva peacocks, they would just die. They would hurt themselves. So it's a bit like if we were to read um, the Golden Light Sutra, there's a nice chapter about the tigress. Some of you know this chapter on the tigress, where um, the Buddha in one of his previous lives saw that there was a hungry tigress who was so starving that she was about to eat her cubs. And the Buddha saw this and he was just like, oh, this is horrible. This is the saddest thing. I can't bear it if she eats her own cubs. I want her to eat me instead. And so he gave her his arm and she starts eating him. And um, he has just blissful bodhicitta experiences while he's being eaten by a hungry tiger, right? And so we could read this chapter in the Golden Light Sutra and think, that's so beautiful, that's so amazing. I want to be a bodhisattva, I want to be a Buddha. I could feed myself to a hungry tiger. And then you might, and then the tiger would bite you and you'd go, ah! <laughs> No, 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 I spoke too soon. I can't be eaten by a tiger. I don't have enough bodhicitta, yeah? So what it's saying is that you can't do full-on bodhisattva practices before you're ready or it's not skillful, yeah? You have to know where you are. And so you can take examples like the Buddha in his previous life, offering his body to the hungry tigress and be so inspired that this is where you are going but don't think that then just by understanding that, that that is where you are. Even if it's where you would like to be, even if you think it's just beautiful and amazing, if your bodhicitta isn't steady enough, you'll generate strong regret for doing a virtuous thing, which creates huge obstacles to your path. So for us, this could be like if, um, if we see some charity that we really want to give money to, 
say, um, you know, recently there were these horrible bushfires in Australia when I was there. And I wanted to give money to the bushfire relief and to the volunteer firefighters. And I wanted to help some way and I didn't know how I could help. So I thought one way I can help is to give some money. Now, of course, I don't really have any money. <laughs> So for me to give like my whole bank account to the bushfire relief would not have made a huge difference. And then I wouldn't be able to buy groceries, right? Um, so the urge to help was good, but it would not be skillful for me to drain my bank account. It wouldn't help the greater good. And even if it did, probably I don't have enough bodhicitta to sort of do that with an open heart and be 100% happy afterwards and not worry about the deprivation that would come after. So, you know, so then you take a step back and you say, what can I do in a sustainable way? Because what normally happens is that if we can't do the perfect form of whatever good deed it is, then we feel bad about ourselves and don't do anything. Yeah? That's what often happens. So then you think, what's the manageable amount? Can I give $5, five shekels, whatever? Can I give a small amount? Or can I volunteer my energy? Can I volunteer my time? Can I offer this or this skill that I have? Can I offer it for free? And you get creative by noticing where you actually are. And then you can offer something and feel so happy about it the whole way through. But for us, it's like, if we can't do it perfectly, then we can't do it at all, and there's no point in doing it, and it just becomes this whole ego trip. To be a bodhisattva or to be an aspiring bodhisattva, it's about really recognizing what is the best I can offer right now in a sustainable way, again and again. Because if I offer everything all at once and burn up everything, then what do I have left tomorrow to offer? Do you know what I mean? So it's, it's saying here in these verses, basically, don't pretend to be a peacock while you're still a crow, you know, because the very same thing that makes them stronger could really harm you. Yeah, know where you are. So it's, you know, we're aspiring to be these bodhisattva peacocks. And then we could start to think that we're better at this than we are because we're so inspired. And on a good day, we can. But, you know, it's just taking a little bit of a step back and saying, what's the amount of poison my body is able to cope with? And it becomes like an inoculation against poison. Because it's not like when the bodhisattva peacocks are eating the poison that it's making them sicker and sicker. No, it's making them stronger and stronger. So we want to think of it like a vaccine um, or antidote has a little bit of the venom in it, doesn't it? Right? If you get bitten by a snake and you go to the hospital, they're going to give you an antidote that has a tiny bit of the venom in it. So you're inoculating yourself, you know, in a, a small enough amount that then your body can develop all of the things it needs to develop to be able to fight off the poison. Does it make sense? But if we were to just take the snake and like say, you know, bite me, bite me more, 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 we would just die. Yeah. So you know that like a little bit, actually will make you stronger at this stage and it's going to be this gradual gradual process so what's the amount of poison you can take on the path today that's not overkill okay so this this verse is really about trying to prevent um going too fast too hard and then burning out and having a backlash and harming yourself this is a lot about um people who do retreat maybe too intensely before they're ready and get, you know, the meditator's disease, heart lung, which is, um, lung just means wind in Tibetan, but it's a, it's a inner wind disorder where you've pushed so hard that you've given yourself some chronic anxiety. And so we don't want to do that. Um, and it's delicate because on a good day, you can do more than on a difficult day. Yeah. There's a question. Yes, exactly. Yeah, Venerable saying don't do lion deeds with a rabbit heart. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, so we just have to kind of sit with this a little bit because we go between being really inspired to being kind of deflated. Yeah, we think this is so amazing. I'm gonna do it. Oh, this is really amazing. It's too hard. I can't. Do you know this place in your practice where you're like inspired and really motivated and then you're daunted and it's overwhelming? And you kind of go back and forth 
and we need to kind of bring into now what does this look like for me today for me today what can i do yeah for me today what can i do and it just sometimes it can be as simple as just sitting quietly and coming back to your motivation because part of what um can protect you from negative states of mind is preempting them with a positive state of mind. Eventually, negative states of mind themselves can be uh, the very fuel that we use in order to develop bodhicitta. That's going to be gradual, and we can only do it sometimes and a little bit at a time. Yeah. So these these two verses, four and five, are very much about that. Um, verse six says. And thus bodhisattvas are likened to peacocks. They live on delusions, those poisonous plants, transforming them into the essence of practice. They thrive in the jungle of everyday life. Whatever is presented, they always accept while destroying the poison of clinging desire. Yeah. Uncontrollable wandering through rounds of existence is caused by our grasping at egos as real. This ignorant attitude heralds the demon of selfish concern for our welfare alone. We seek some security for our own egos. We want only pleasure and shun any pain. But now we must banish all suffering, compuls all selfish compulsion, and gladly take hardship for all others' sake. So if you were just to guess, what practice do you think verse 7 is talking to? Yeah. If you were just to guess, what does verse 7 remind you of? Tonglen says enough. Yep, exactly. Exactly. Tonglen giving and taking. Exactly. So it's, um, it's, it's a hard thing to do, but we can do this mental attitude where, you know, it's, it's very pointed the way this verse puts it, that we seek some security for our own egos. We want only pleasure and shun any pain. But now, if we want to be bodhisattvas, we must banish all selfish compulsion and gladly take hardship for all others' sake. So it's, it's again this attitude that says, I'm lucky in the sense that I've met a path and I'm lucky in the sense or fortunate or my karma is ripening in the sense that I actually have enough mental space to look at life a little bit differently before I met the Dharma or before I met teachings that encourage an examined life, when there was difficulty, the best I could hope for was to just try to cope, right? Back in the day, you know, think of back before you were a Dharma practitioner or back before you met any kind of, I don't know, examination tools or self-awareness tools. If you can just kind of sit with how you were before you knew there were other ways to think. You know, there was so few possibilities for us in those days. And so if you can think, all right, others are not less than me. You know, people that don't have a spiritual path are not less than me, but they have fewer tools available to them. So because I am fortunate enough to have my good karma ripen in such a way that I've met a path, I'm really the one that needs to do this. I'm the one that needs to be bigger than this suffering situation and try to not make it all about me. Yeah, I can because I've met tools that help me do that. So, you know, you're suffering with whatever, unemployment or having to work at home or suffering with this or suffering with that. And other people in your household and in your neighborhood are also suffering. But if they don't have the same skill set and the same tools as you, of course they're going to be just kind of in amongst this victim mentality, trying to cope the best they can. And we can get swept up in that very easily. We can get swept up in it and think everyone else is suffering, so I should be suffering too, just to feel the same, to not feel alienated or alienating. But in fact, we're the one that can actually be a bit bigger than the situation and not add stress to where there is already stress. Yeah. So yes, Sashuki so saying corona, uh, coronavirus is a huge opportunity for practice. Exactly, exactly. Because we all have our personal relationship to how we're dealing with this, don't we? Some of us are stressed, some of us are relaxed, some of us are annoyed, some of us are bored, some of us are don't, don't worry so much at all. You know, it, there's a huge spectrum of how we're reacting to all of this. Not to mention if we got sick or not. 
but you know the way we're coping is going to be very varied and i think that it's very normal and human to react the way we see others reacting yeah it's very normal to react the way we see others reacting because we're kind of a herd <laughs> creature you know we're like a whole bunch of deer or a i don't know school of fish and we want to do what others are doing and we want to relate to them and feel close to them but actually are we even as stressed as we're making out to be sometimes that can happen can't it where we kind of adopt the attitude of being a certain level of stress just to kind of connect with our fellow man when in fact we're sort of fine because we have a big picture idea about it and you know we know that uh, world systems come and go and that sentient beings come and go and extinctions come and go and the mind continues and eventually we'll all be enlightened and it's just going to be a matter of effort and time um but we have kind of a big picture attitude that's making us not that worried and yet we value this perfect human life right we have a precious human rebirth which is very rare and so we want to make the best use of it but that's not the same thing as having a panic or an anxiety about it so i think it's useful to separate what is my actual reaction to what's happening and what is the reaction i'm adopting just because i'm kind of mirroring the people around me do you ever have this where it's sort of like you're acting like everyone else because that's just normal but actually you're having a different mental state than them and you can stretch yourself to be bigger than the situation if you remember do you know what i mean yeah so so there's you know the practice we already have that we can engage with and then there's the practice that we are developing and can use this as an opportunity to do that so you know this can bring out the best in us or not and you know it's our choice really but um you know i think there's a lot of conversations people are having lately about you don't need to make this moment and this situation a huge a huge pressure on yourself to have magical self-discovery self-awareness transformation weight loss <laughs> new hobbies new skills you know, don't put huge pressure on yourself that just because things are dramatic right now, that you need to suddenly have dramatic transformation and dramatic results. You might, right? If you use this time to practice, you might have dramatic results and dramatic transformation, but you don't want to put that pressure on yourself because it will, again, have a backlash and it's um, too soon to eat so much poison. Yeah, just a little bit inoculating yourself gradually little bit little bit and what we can use this time for is to just see like a mindfulness bell that wakes you up you know that maybe there was a level of your practice you'd let slid a little bit yeah your practice had slided and you know now it's like oh right there's a crisis right now um i need to reconnect yeah like this yeah so tonglen um if you were to practice tonglen I think practicing it with this coronavirus would be really interesting, wouldn't it? Because it's respiratory. And so the idea of breathing in the illness could really freak you out. Because um, you're not really, are you, with Tonglen? You're not literally taking the suffering of others. But to adopt that attitude, especially with something that's respiratory, could be very useful for making um, the object of negation really arise right for making the false eye really show itself because imagine someone with the coronavirus right in front of you and that you could breathe it all in and take it from them wouldn't part of you go oh i don't really want to i mean i do i'm a good bodhisattva i'm a good bodhisattva oh but i don't really want to yeah there would be this kind of push and pull of how we'd like to be and how we actually are and that could be a very interesting meditation to do for yourself um, you know, maybe in the lunch break or after class to just kind of experiment with doing Tonglen with the coronavirus because it might very well trigger the self-cherishing thought and the object of negation very strongly. And that's useful because if you can catch it, you can destroy it. But it's hard for us to catch it sometimes. So just very gently, okay? Don't, don't take all of this um, kind of heroic attitudes and courageous ideals as pressure, okay? Use it as a framework to kind of let yourself grow into and feel happy that such ideas exist, you know? 
So, so keep there's the what you intellectually understand and then there's what you're actually able to practice and what you're actually able to practice is a lot less and that's completely normal and fine okay um, it's just happy news to have a framework and a way of thinking about life yeah that you can be right in the jungle of samsara and thrive in it yeah thrive in your spiritual practice yeah. okay so going on page eight is there any um or um verse eight did you want to ask anything about Tonglen or add anything about Tonglen? All our sufferings derive from our habits of selfish delusions we heed and act out. Yeah, just that sentence. Yeah, just that sentence. All of our sufferings, all of our sufferings <laughs> derive from our habits of selfish delusions we heed and act out. So the selfish delusions we believe and then act from, right? That we believe and then act from. This sentence is really important. It's really the crux of the issue, right? It's, it's the main point that we're looking at. So to think very simply, all of our sufferings derive from our habits of selfish delusions, all of our sufferings, right? So then think of all of your sufferings, not all of them all at once, you'll overwhelm yourself. But you know, just like, okay, Hmm, huh, hmm. There can be this push and pull internally because before examination, you might think, no, I'm suffering because of this and that and this and that and this and that. No, we're suffering because our response to them and the fact that they happened is the ripening result of our negative karma. So what's the danger in thinking this way? Is there a danger in thinking this way? <laughs> Yeah, there's benefits in thinking this way, which are maybe obvious, but are there dangers? Yeah. Um, it can be very easy to get into spiritual bypassing. Yeah, you know, this, this concept where you jump from real life experience into what you think should be the case. Yeah, Nisan and Ilil are saying self-hatred can come. Exactly, because you can take what's happening to you as somehow something you deserve, you know, like you're being punished for how bad you are. Forgetting that karma has never been about punishment and reward. Karma has never been, been about being bestowed anything from anything. It's just natural cause and effect, just natural cause and effect. But, you know, self-hatred can come really easily when you're suffering because you start to feel like you deserve it, you know, like it's justice or something. Yeah. Yeah, Anna's saying that uh, it ne neglects things what we should take care of. Yeah, we can, we can, uh, yeah, no, it's interesting. Yeah, look, it's, it's very easy to take these really high ideals and want to live up to them and then think that you are living up to them because you can kind of jump over your experience into a version of mind training. Yeah, you know this when you sort of, there's the suffering you're experiencing and then there's the way you know to think about it because you're a good Dharma student and you've been taught. And instead of kind of being really authentic and real with what you're actually in, you jump to this high ideal and skip over the fact that you haven't addressed any number of things in between. So this spiritual bypassing can make you feel like you're more developed than you actually are, but it's fragile and it's inauthentic. And when you do it to yourself and when you do it to others, they can feel like you're being a bit plastic or that you're being a bit um, naive. Yeah, that you're being a bit naive or not worldly in a good way. Because um, if you say, oh, it's just your karma. I mean, what does that do to people? It really does sound like you're saying, oh, it's just your fault or it's just your fate. Neither of which are the case. Yeah. Oh, it's just your destiny. You just have to cope with it. Oh, it's just a, it's a teaching that's been given to you. No, neither of those. You've not been giving a, given a teaching. You can choose to make it a teaching. This is the very, very important distinction between new age ideas of karma and Buddhist ideas of karma. You are not being given a lesson. You are not being given a teaching. You're choosing to see it as a lesson. You're choosing to make it a teaching. And of course, the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas want to benefit you and are doing the best they can with conditions. 
and doing the best they can with kind of orchestrating the things around you to help you wake up. But, you know, it's a very different thing than um, feeling like everything has been bestowed upon you or something. Can you feel the distinction, right? There can be a real misunderstanding about karma. So whether what's happening to you is a teaching or not is completely up to you. Yeah, you make it a teaching. And then you're empowered to use it as a teaching. And that very empowerment self-liberates, right? Then you're in charge of your own path, right? You don't have to be waiting to be blessed by something you're opening yourself up to the fact that there are constant blessings from all of the enlightened beings constantly flooding into you who want nothing but your welfare, right? All the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas want is for you to have lasting happiness and they would just give it to you if they could. They're not waiting for you to go through some sort of struggle to build your character or something. If they could just take your suffering, they would, right? But they can't because of your karma. Yeah, so if you can do whatever you can to clear all that blocks you, then the blessings just flood through constantly. And you can start to see everything in life as together with kind of some beneficial aspect from the enlightened mind, you know? And if you're not um, comfortable thinking in those terms, think of it in a completely secular way of, I can reframe my experience or not, it's up to me. I can choose to reframe things and make them work for me, or I can choose to feel like a victim of circumstance. Yeah, it's my choice. Yeah, when we feel like a victim of circumstance, it doesn't feel like there's a choice to think any other way. Yeah, things are happening to you, happening to you. No, things are happening from you, they're happening from you. Yeah. So, so, so all of this is really um, to say, you know, liberation's in the palm of your hand, this old saying. Um, but, you know, to, to not feel burdened by it, but to feel liberated by it. So then you don't feel like you have to wait for a certain teacher or a certain teaching. You don't have to wait for a certain retreat to come up. You don't have to wait for your life to be more under control or for there to be more space in the day. You don't have to wait for anything. Yeah. All you have to do is click back into mindfulness of this moment together with bodhicitta right not passive mindfulness but active mindfulness with bodhicitta and now you're practicing and now you're progressing on the path and just like that you've clicked into something that's functional and useful and you've made your day and your life meaningful yeah so if you can frame it in that way of you don't need to wait for anything yeah you have everything that you need and if you just practiced what you already knew really well you would go so far you know we're often thinking i need to get this teaching and get that teaching and get this teaching but if we just practiced what we already knew we'd be doing amazing yeah so so just kind of sit with that a little bit yeah because if you're mindful with bodhicitta then everything you've learned intellectually and anything that you've integrated is kind of really accessible at your fingertips if you don't have mindfulness with bodhicitta, you can learn everything perfectly and be able to recite it by heart, but it's not coming into your daily life and it's not having a direct impact. So mindfulness, excuse me, is like the gateway between what you've understood and integrated and pulling it into your everyday life. Yeah, it's like the gateway. So you have to have this like mindfulness that can pull what you know into the day. So just kind of have that in the back of your mind um, while we have lunch and see if you can have some uh, bodhicitta mindfulness while uh, really enjoying something healthy and delicious and a bit of rest and just let yourself be very present with that idea and uh, let it rejuvenate you so that you can hear more. Okay, so um, if there's any questions, you can um, pop them in the chat and I can start the next session with those questions or else I'll just um, start as normally. So your choice. We'll just dedicate really quickly. Ok. 
Okay, so we'll come back in uh, hour and 15.